you just state your name and your clan name? Joe Gwisho and Jasta. Anadaga Heino. I'm uh, um, Oren Lyons, that's my English name. Joe Gwisho is my clan name. Uh, the Wolf is my, my clan. Anadaga is my nation. The Haudenosaunee is the Confederacy. And the Confederacy is better known as the Iroquois. We're old people. Been here a long time. So the first question, from your vantage point and from your people's vantage point, what is creation? Well, that's huge. It's huge like creation. Creation is the universe. Creation is everything that we can see and probably a whole lot that we can't, probably more that we can't see. But it's what's about us, and it's the relationship, this amazing uh, web of life that we have here. And, and nature, which is part of creation, is more like the Earth itself in its part, in its position, in this whole web of life in the creation. We have relationships with uh, all the elements and forces of life, including the sun, we call our elder brother, the moon, we call our grandmother, the uh, winds, we call our grandfathers, the four directions, our grandfathers, and then all of the elements of life itself. So in this idea of creation, nature is the earth itself, and we call the earth mother, Itinoha, our mother, as we call all women Itinoha, mothers. And from mothers spring life, and we understand that. And we know that life springs from the earth, that generations that are looking up layer upon layer, waiting their time to come up and, and serve and be, is our responsibility. So the earth is, is female. How are, the earth is, a fe is the mother, and so how are humans described? What kind of, are, what kind of agents are well, then the then if, if, if you have, uh, if you have a mother, then you have children. So we're children. We're children of the earth. And uh, we're tied to the earth. We come from the earth and we go back to the earth. And, and the earth has great systems of uh, regeneration, great cycles of regenerative life. And it's these cycles that we're all part of, just as the earth has seasons of life, all animals and all things that grow and fly, and, and including humans, have seasons of life as well. And so we, we grow in the same style. What's different about all of that is the time, the time that's allocated to the varieties of life that are on the earth. And we have a fairly long system of life, but not the longest. Turtles live beyond, beyond us. Parrots live beyond us. Um, there are certain mammals that, that are, have an older uh, life cycle than we do, but we have a long life cycle as it is on Earth. And then also, when you move down to the fine insects, then their life cycle is counted in days. So what you have is this variety and complexity of life and, and the times that are allocated and what happens during those times for each of these elements. That's what's important to understand. In the understanding of the earth, how does, what does, 
what are your recommendations for how we should treat the how humans treat the world and the planet and our resources? What is the disposition that we need to take humans toward the gifts that the planet provides us? Well, what I've noticed and know about indigenous people around the earth is that many, many indigenous nations have have been able to uh, to hang on to the knowledge that they have, the traditional knowledge. Fortunately, I think for everybody, and uh, and in this traditional knowledge is the um, directions uh, are the instructions for a good life. So we have instructions about uh, how do we conduct ourselves on this earth. And probably the first one is uh, respect. And I think if there was a law, a common law around the world, uh, indigenous peoples, and I think everybody, respect is a law. And, and if people followed this law, simple law of respect, they'd have a lot more peace and you'd have a lot more uh, quiet and, and, and a better life. So I'd say respect, uh, conduct yourself accordingly and, and recognize what your obligations are and what your duties are. And the duties are to protect these life forms. When the peacemaker came to our territory about a thousand years ago, and brought this whole concept of peace as the original five nations, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, Senecas, uh, were in a constant warfare. And we had really forgotten our instructions that we had prior to that and were not living by them. And the peacemaker came among us and, and brought this whole idea, concept of peace and democracy. And he gave it to us whole. And it took him a long time to do that. There's a whole story about how he came and how we worked with Hayan Wenta, whom you call Hiawatha, and how they worked and brought together this great confederacy called the Haudenosaunee based on peace, based on equity, justice for people, and based on the power of the good minds the power of unity, the issues of health, all given to us a thousand years ago. And, and he laid out the process by which we, we do this. And, and one of the first things he said was he was going to give great responsibility to the women. Since the earth is female, then the women should be working with the earth. Men would be in charge of fire women would be in charge of water. And so we're, we're the, the men, our, our work to see to the welfare. We do counseling. We do meetings. We do all of that. And if needs be, we fight. Uh, but basically, we're, we're dedicated to peace. And that was what's, what's so important about that time a thousand years ago. When if you looked in, in Europe at that time, as great wars were going on, and the whole history of Europe, as I saw it, is one war after the other, century after century, how people lived in constant, constant fear, and thousands of thousands of people died. Well, in this part of the, the universe, which was kind of just uh, isolated, the Western Hemisphere wasn't even known about, we were operating under a different system. And it was basically one of respect and councils of, of leaders to try to keep the peace, because human nature is human nature. And you have to have a process by which to meet problems. And you have to have uh, rules and so forth. So the rules was always based around respect. And fundamental to all of that was, was the understanding of how the earth itself uh, was paramount to all of our life. And so in this uh, idea of respect was also the understanding of what 
we should do and how we should conduct ourselves according to the elements of the earth and all of the natural worlds. So we always said that we were, we have been told and understand that we're relatives. And where our white brother will talk about water and talk trees and animals and fish as resources, we talk about them as relatives. And that's a whole different perspective. If you think that they're relatives and you understand it and, and you understand that, then you're going to treat them differently. And the responsibility the peacemaker said to us were very clear. He planted a great tree of peace, a great white pine, a great symbol to our nations. He said, this is the great tree of peace. He said, its roots will be four white roots of truth that reach in the four directions of the earth. And those that have no, nowhere to go can follow the root back to its source and come under the protection of the great tree. And he says, on top of this tree, I place the eagle, and the eagle who will watch everything and watch and guard the security of this tree and will let us know when problems are coming. And he said that this tree of peace is a spiritual law. It represents a spiritual law. And the spiritual law is the law of nature. And he told us explicitly, never challenge this law because you cannot prevail. You will not prevail. Wrap your laws, your rules, and your conduct. He said, you, the leaders, when you're, when you're weak as a human being, he said, this tree will give you your spine strength. Wrap yourself around this tree because it's powerful. Do not challenge the laws of nature because you cannot, you will not prevail. Now that's great wisdom. That's a thousand years ago. And it reminded us uh, of, of our obligations. And so Indian nations in North America, South America, Central America, as far as I know, indigenous people around the world all have ceremonies. And these ceremonies are thanksgivings for what we have. Uh, we have just now initiated uh, a great ceremony for the trees at Onondaga, and the longhouses of the Six Nations still operational. And we hold these ceremonies for the leader of the trees, which is the maple. The maple is the leader, and so we have ceremony of thanksgiving as soon as the sap starts running and then when the sap stops then we'll have a closure ceremony but in between we're thankful for all trees of this earth wherever they are whatever their names are those that we know and those that we don't we give thanks and so if this kind of instruction were given and understood by other people and you wouldn't be cutting trees all over the world and destroying the infrastructure of life and everything that's in the woods. We had a, a, a profound agreement when we first initiated the five nations, later become the six nations with the uh, Tuscarora Nation, came in 1713, 1722, became the six nation, but we all agreed we all agreed that we would work together and be together. And so we had a treaty amongst ourselves. And it was called simply, One Dish, One Spoon. That's a concept of sharing. And this world has to understand the importance of sharing. I know that in the structure of the United States, it's very contrary to that. People are not instructed to share. They're instructed to gain. They're instructed to hold to themselves. They're instructed to, to gather unto themselves. Uh, and they're rewarded for that. And so you have, a, you have an instruction that's contrary, very contrary to this whole concept, if indeed this is what you think is right. But this I'm simply telling you what our instructions are. And so, operating under this, you know, I've traveled to Indian nations across North America and 
Central America. And I always am invited to the ceremonies and I know what's going on. I may not understand the language and the dances may be different, but I know what is being said. It's always the same. Thanksgiving to the creation. Thanksgiving to the, to the life-giving forces of the earth. And you know, when the Christians came here, they, they made life hard for us. They brought a whole different thought and an idea. And we're still suffering from that. But we can get into that on a later time. But in, in relation to all of this, and you're talking about conduct, a conduct is quite simple, respect for life and understanding that life is our relatives and how goes it with them, goes it with us. And so we've taken this to a high degree. Um, I'm a uh, chief, one of the chiefs in the Council of Chiefs at Onondaga, and I sit on behalf of the Turtle Clan, even though I myself am a wolf. And I've been there for since 1967. I have a lot of experience with different administrations, with different events in this country, and I've watched a lot of changes. And I see that we're not doing very well, that we seem to be moving farther and farther away from what would be good for our grandchildren and their children. And so I think that the instructions for people is to be respectful for life, Appreciate what you have, share what you have, and make up your own mind about things. Uh, it's very difficult to, to deal with a whole nation that's instructed to be greedy. You know, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, to, to be mindful of yourself and your own doings and, and uh, to secure everything for yourself and, and to become as they pointed out a few days ago, one of the billionaires of the world. They, they promote that, and they say that's great, and they say this is what you should be striving for. But we look at it differently. That amount of wealth in this time in life in Earth is a lot of influence, and a handful of people with that amount of influence and that kind of a direction in life are not going to take you in the right direction. I mean, they piecemeal stuff, and they can't say that they're bad people, but uh, we don't say that at all. We just say that their instructions seem to be directed in the wrong way. And interesting, you know, to us being a, an American Indian and familiar with the processes of uh, foundations and people trying to get money for this and that and poor Indians and, and so forth, First of all, today, in all of uh, the United States, we're less than 1% of the population of the country. And support for Indian causes from the foundation world is 0.06%, not even 1% going to Indians. Why is that? You know, it's an interesting question. Why, why is it that they don't want us to survive, that they don't see it's important, and that maybe we're uh, more of a problem? I mean, the whole process of the United States history has been to assimilate us, and of course, it's a question of land. So we've been fighting this, this whole issue of land, land claims, you know, in 1492, we owned all of North America and owned it in the broad sense in that it was in our caretaking and no one owns the land. It always belongs to your children and your grandchildren. So we were protecting it in their interest. Well, a whole different thought came here. And when they first said they wanted to buy land, our leaders laughed and they said, how can you buy land? They said, that's like buying water or buying air. You can't buy land. Land belongs to everybody. But certainly not. And, and today we can see, yes, they do buy land. And you can fly over America and you can see all the squares. But all this land is bought. But 
the land that you bought, you don't carry the responsibility that goes with the land. It's a personal gathering. And so the consequence of that is it's deteriorating. And so I don't know what the, what the answer is to all of this, except that uh, under the leadership of this country right now, we're going downhill fast. And I think that this present administration, uh, Mr. Bush, is acting in a criminal manner in not uh, telling the children or protecting the children and grandchildren's interests. He's not protecting their interests. And that's really criminal. I mean, that's going against our instruction entirely. He's not protecting life. He's promoting the interests of business. And their interest is profit. So we're in the problem, and the consequence of which we look at. The present state of the world is, is um, very serious in terms of its health and how the health relates to us. I think we have to understand something here, and that is that uh, the earth can deteriorate and ultimately um, lose its life-giving forces, and it can uh, change and become barren, or it can change and become snow. It has uh, its, own, its own direction. It has its own will and ability. And uh, we're part of that. And so right now, I see two big, two big areas of concern. Some time back, when Einstein was asked a question about what is the most powerful law of the universe, he said it was the law of compound. And I pondered that, you know, and I said, compound, what does that actually mean? And, and I really thought about it and have been thinking about it lately, and uh, I come to the conclusion that it's kind of like an explosion in reverse. It starts slow and ends fast. Where an explosion starts uh, fast and ends slow. So compound, or in two that I see, and one is a compound of the ice melting, and the other is a compound of human population. Both are moving and accelerating. Both are under their own direction. It doesn't seem like there's a control factor here uh, for either one. Certainly, the, the ice melt is something beyond uh, uh, our control at the moment, because what it takes, it takes the instruction of the peacemaker to be of one mind. He said, when you're of one mind, the power of the good mind can change anything. And so, uh, so we have to somehow get to that point of unity of thought and direction and effort. And if we can do that, we certainly can mitigate what's going on now. You know, when we're concerned is for the children and their grandchildren and their children. Peacemaker said, you know, that uh, that we're responsible and that we should be always watching. And, and so uh, I think what he's saying and, and uh, the instruction is correct and, and could, could happen. Uh, America is isolated from the world, both in thought and conduct, size, oceans. And in that isolation, uh, you know, it's heavily involved in, in what's going on inside America. Like, for instance, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm part of that, too, because um, the other, this weekend, Syracuse University just, just won, the, you know, the Big East title. Well, I'm an alumni of Syracuse, and so I enjoyed that. But this whole country, is, is fixed on the idea of sports. It's fixed on the idea of, of uh, distractions and, and uh, human titillation, if you will, or whatever it may be. And they're not looking at the large pictures. And they've become insulated against the realities of the world. 
Uh, even our poor people, poor people in the U.S. would be wealthy in any other part of the world. I mean, poor people in America have television sets. That's not the way it is in the rest of the world. And we're just maybe one-fifth of the population of the whole world, and yet we're, we're using one-quarter of all the resources. I know Vice President Cheney said, well, if we're creating one-quarter of the energy of the world, then it's just right for us to use one-quarter of the resources. Well, that kind of thinking is very destructive. So I think we have to adjust and, and be, be alert and aware. We have to get a message to the people, and they have to understand the seriousness of this situation right now, this compounding of human population. You know, Lester Brown, who, who is who's, you know, recognized as one of the great uh, scientists of the world concerning environment and interests, said that um, in 1950, there was 2.5 billion people in the world. 2,000, there were 6 billion. So in that short time, we almost doubled, tripled the population of the world. That's not sustainable. That is not sustainable. You can't do that. But we are. You know, and, and that's a reality. Who knows that? Who thinks about that? I heard Ted Turner say that one time. He says, well, in my lifetime, I've seen this population double. And you think about that. You know, it took four million years to get to that point. It takes something like 50 years to do it twice. No, that don't work. And so that's what we're facing in the world today. We have China, who has 1 billion people, more, 1.3, I think, maybe probably more by this time. India, which has 1 billion people, just the two of them, are one-third of the population of the world, and they're busy. Yeah, we started out with that. You talked about the destroying of nature. And just what have your counsel said about this data? Or has this been predicted? What were the signs? And have the signs occurred? Have these signs, have things come to pass that you've been predicting? Yeah, OK. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, uh, that Indian nations have what they call prophecies. But also, the Bible has prophecies. And, and people have had prophecies all the time. It seems to be part of human nature. And these prophecies, uh, currently we're, we're working on, on, on organizing them. And as I studied them, I come to the conclusion they're not so much prophecies as they are instructions of conduct. And the prophecies being that this will happen if you don't do this. Or this will happen if, if you drop this. So it always leaves uh, the, the option to the present. It always leaves the option to the current generation. And I think that that's the, the importance of these prophecies. Now, we've had uh, three, three major events for the Haudenosaunee. One was the first time when we were given the instructions of how to live, which some people would call um, religion or ceremonies. And that was long ago. We're not sure exactly when, but we do know the process, and we knew what happened, how it happened. That was very, very, very long ago. And then somehow we got lost, personally. I mean, the six, five nations and began this fighting. And then we had the second instruction support that was the coming of the peacemaker spiritual being who gave us this great idea of democracy and organized our thoughts in that direction and I mentioned earlier that uh, he gave this responsibility of raising the leaders to the to the women um, he also instructed us on the importance of clans so I think uh, this relationship is important. People should understand the relationship between us and the natural world. And we 
we love that so much that we have taken on the symbol of, of our, our relatives. And so, as you see, I'm wearing the symbol of, of the turtle. Well, the turtle also represents uh, North America, the Great Turtle Island. And it's a symbol of longevity and of strength. And so we have a turtle clan. And yet I told you I'm a wolf. So we have a relative of a wolf. And the deer, and the bear, and the eel, and the hawk, and the beaver, snipe, all of these. And, and the different nations have different clans sometimes. I'm just astonished by the amount of clans that the Hopis have and the amount of clans that the Navajos have. They have a wind clan. They have a, they have a, just about whatever you could think of. There's a clan, but it's all related to nature. And so that's how we see ourselves. And a, and a wolf is a wolf is a wolf. And so I'm always mindful of what's happening to my four-footed brother. And we were instructed to watch that and to see because they said, whatever happens to him is going to happen to you. And so how we treat these, these uh, animals who are, who are doing what they do uh, in, a, in kind of a... Uh, they live in a state of grace. They, d they don't do anything wrong. They just do what they do. And they do their best to do it in spite of everything and everything they continue. So, you know, in New York City, as we sit here pretty quick now, there's going to be hawks flying through here. And certainly the geese are flying. And this is an old flyway right here. They used to stop here all the time. They still fly. They still go by here because it's an old rule, an old law. It goes on. It's just that you don't see them. But they are doing their best to continue. And so it's like that around everywhere. And we have to understand this relationship. And so we have that. And it brings us closer. And it helps us to, to respect better uh, how, they, how they serve with us and how life works. And quite a while back, maybe 150 years ago, Chief Seattle said something that was very profound. He said a lot that was very profound. But one thing he said was, we are part of a web of life, and every strand is important, and that what befalls one part will befall the other. And so this is what we don't seem to understand or comprehend, is this, this web of life that we, we live in and how interdependent we are. So, you know, there, there was also an observation made just not very long ago about the body weight of human beings, some way, way, way back, many years, when, when the body weight was just something like one point something of, of the weight of, of all mammals in the world. And today, the body weight of human beings is 98%. And all of the animals in the world are 2%. You think about that. Think what we've done already. So there's a great imbalance. There's a great imbalance of humanity on this earth, and, and the natural laws don't abide that. They don't abide. And they, uh, there's law, and the ba best thing you can do is keep the balance. So we should be paying real attention to that. And just the quality of life that comes from all the beings that are here will be, they'll be denied our grandchildren. And then when they lose that, then they lose even better perspective of how to survive. So we're destroying their well-being. We're really destroying the, the efforts that they can put forward if they have the respect and knowledge. I don't know. This style of talking and observation, they tell me, is not realistic in today's times. And I suppose not if you're thinking in terms of Wall Street and you're thinking in terms of power and authority. But in the long run, it is absolutely the law. 
And as the peacemaker told us a long time ago, it will prevail. And so the earth itself, well, it'll change. It'll cool down. We'll have another ice age. And we're in that process right now. The trigger has been pulled, the action is taken, and it's going on right now. And I've had long discussions with scientists in different parts of the world, and they tell us that's exactly what's going on. The amazing thing is that this country, the United States, refuses to acknowledge that. Just astonishing. And, and uh, time is an element now. And now we're bringing in another element, time. So how much time? And that's always a question. There was a three-part series uh, written in the New Yorker. I don't know whether you're aware of it or saw it last spring, written by this woman. Probably, I think, one of the best compilations of fact. Very realistic assessment of what's going on. And in that discussion, in her story, she told about how this present administration went to one of the scientists that knows about all of this here in New York and asked him what was his prognosis. And he said, it's bad. We'll be lucky to be here in 100 years and maybe sooner. And he said also that people are going to have to adapt to the changes, but the changes are going to come so fast that you won't be able to adapt. So it struck a chord because I remember at one point when, when uh, the president was asked about, about this climate change, which is a softer discussion of global warming. When he was asked about this, he said, well, we're just going to have to adapt. So now I understood that he did know, and he was instructed. And he simply chose to use the words, we will have to adapt. Well, of course we will. I mean, there's no other option. And whether you're capable, he didn't go on any, any further. So his awareness then is obvious, and which makes his culpability more. The world needs good leaders and good leadership. So I think uh, what's happening now uh, is, is clearly an indication of where we are. It's a international, universal action now taken by these huge systemic changes. The Gulf Stream is slowing down in the Atlantic Ocean, has been slowing down. 1960, the whole of the Atlantic Ocean was pure salt water. And now a convection of, of ice water, snow, and the melting of the snow and ice has mitigated the salt water. And we now have a convection of, of fresh water that's reaching all the way to the Carolinas. The result is that the Gulf Stream is slowing down. And a re report from the University of Bergen, a, uh, a university that sits on the coastline of Norway, who monitors the current, I gave a report in 2001. And they said more or less, and uh, you know, I don't have the exact words, but more or less they said Gulf Stream slowing down. And if it continues to slow down at the pace it's going, it could conceivably stop altogether within the next 15 years. And so here we are now, and that's what's changing. Now we're hearing and seeing in one report after another the acceleration of the ice melt. Well, that's the condition of the Earth. That's where we are. And so how do we, how do we meet that challenge? Well, we have to take some instruction and, and people, I, I should give you uh, some hope here in that, uh, in that other nations of the world are very much aware of this and are trying hard. And they look at the United States as completely crazy. They think that this country is just simply not in its right mind in the direction it's taking. And, and they're looking at us as a whole. But um, I remember, too, that uh, when in 1992, when we went to the Rio meeting on uh, the issues of environment, a great meeting that was held in Rio, and when President Bush, number one, spoke, he said, 
and I guess I have to paraphrase again because I do remember it. He said, a, uh, and I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, he said the American standard of living for the human for the United States is not up for discussion here. That's an amazing statement because everybody that come from around the world, I don't know, the biggest gathering of world leaders ever, to meet this problem, and he laid it right out flat. Well, okay, that's everybody's problem, but we're not going to discuss that here. And when you're talking about one of the biggest instigators and problem, and, and the leader says that, then it doesn't leave you much hope. So I think the American population have to really think about leadership now. Got to change leadership, and you've got to get good leadership, and leadership has to be responsive to the, to the welfare of the people, not to the welfare of interests. And those are simple things, but they're very difficult, I think. The democratic process in America has been co-opted now by, by corporations and big money. And, uh, and it's hard to even reach the ear of your representative for the common person. So the common person feel, feels helpless. But they aren't, if they understand. And in this idea of democracy, which I must say, the Iroquois had a lot to do with, you know. If you, you read uh, the discussion by Ben Franklin, he'll tell you, he tell you that he was very, very uh, impressed with this idea of, uh, of democracy and uh, leadership by agreement and consent and, uh, and the, the ability to set up leaders and remove them. He was very, very uh, impressed. And so, uh, you know, from from 1754, when they had the discussion in Albany, plan of union, came directly from Six Nations. He asked our leaders to preside, a chief by the name of Hendrick, Mohawk chief, presided at that time, explained, talk about democracy. So we've had a lot to do, and we have, uh, we have, you know, in 1987, the uh, Senate passed S-76, recognizing the contribution of the Iroquois to the Constitution of the United States. So it, it's, it's there. That was 100 percent passed, if you can think of that, and, and that was hopeful. So I think that uh, the, the earmarks are here of what's happening. You can look about and see the change in temperatures. Everybody's kind of basking in the in the warm winters, and kind of the, they they don't say so, but they like it. But the lack of snow on the ground, the lack of snow on the ground, is bad for the earth. That's water. Earth is water. So when 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 the earth doesn't have a blanket of snow, that it can melt slowly into the earth and and rejuvenate the water, then you're going to have a dry season. And then the influx of winds, high winds, we see that. That was told to us. We were told two things they said to, that will tell you what the condition of the earth will be when the earth is deteriorating. One will be the acceleration of the winds, and the other will be how people treat their children. And we see, you know, it's a comment on both the natural world and a comment on human population. So how people are treating the children today are very bad. We, at the time when people mentioned that, our people, oh, well, that can't be. Who would, who would mistreat children? Well, of course, we know better. We know better today. And the winds we've seen, and they're coming, and they're coming stronger. And this Katrina was just really the beginning. They're going to come more and more. Um, this morning, this morning, watching, watching that string of uh, tornadoes that went through Illinois is just an indication of the violence and the power. We were told long ago that uh, the winds are so strong that if they ever do come down to the earth itself, they can blow the very dirt off the face of the earth. And we don't want to see that. And we're told that the only way to do that is to be respectful in, in your conduct. 
and so there's a lot of indicators indicators of what's going on today population beyond control mother earth has laws and rules and one of them is balance she will keep the balance regardless and if an element is out of balance like the population of human beings on this earth she'll balance it how she does that we may not like most likely it'll come with disease and this will be very democratic it will go across people's lives it'll go across leaders it'll go across everything because really there's no mercy in nature there's only the law and the rule and I think that's where we we fail and we're way way away from that and um, people have taken religion and and confused it with their own ideas of, of power and authority from what I know, and I don't know a lot, I think old age gives you one perspective, and that's the older you get, the more you realize how little you know and how much more there is to know. So at my age, I have a perspective about that, and I see that human nature and human beings have a very consistent way of doing things, and uh, that's learning the hard way. I just love to learn the hard way. And it seems like every generation has that, even though the instructions are clear. So I remember even with my own son, Rex, I a lot of trouble with Rex from the beginning. My daughter was flying. Rex, he had a hard time. And I used to call him Rex the hard way. It took him a long time, but he's doing well. And he had to learn the hard way. And I tell you, it was hard, hard on everybody. But I think in these times, we don't have a lot of time. We don't have, I think time is, a, is, a, is an element here. I know the Maya said to us that um, their calendar is ending in 2012. So I said, well, okay, then what? And they said, well, you know, our, our calendar is predicated on a number of years, and so this number of years is over, and, and we'll simply make another. I said, oh, wow, that's good news. I said, but what about, what, is anything going to happen? And they said, well, there's going to be a period of enlightenment. I said, a period of enlightenment. And I said, what is that? And I wondered about it. And what is enlightenment? Enlightenment is when you suddenly perceive something. And you see it for what it is, and you, you understand it, and it's clear. And I thought, it's probably could be like this group of men that went out on a fishing boat on Montauk Island and such a nice day, they said, let's go swimming. And of course, not realizing that Montauk is a, is a runway for the great white shark. And they're out there splashing around, and one of the men happens to see a fin, a very large proportion, bearing down on him. Now that would be a period of enlightenment. He would see everything clearly. And hard to say what you would think about in a time like that. I should have stayed home. I should have never went swimming. I should have, should have, would have, could have. Uh, it's an old saying, isn't it? Well, that's where we are. We're right there. So the period of enlightenment and the ability for us to deal with it is going to reflect on, I think, the teaching of the peacemaker again. Maurice Strong, who was the Secretary General of UNSET in 1992 in Rio, asked me to repeat for him the instruction from the peacemaker so that he could pass it on to the leaders of the world. And I said, really? He says, I think it's a good instruction. So it goes, it's very simple. And the peacemaker said to the assembled chiefs that he had taken all this time to raise and instruct and give, you know, the, 
the clans and the nations and the responsibilities of the women, responsibilities of the men, responsibilities of the people, which is by far the largest responsibility. And he said that when you sit and you counsel for the welfare of the people, think not of yourself, nor of your family, or even your generation. He said, but make your decisions on behalf of the seventh generation coming so they may enjoy what you have today. So it's an instruction of responsibility. It was a very visionary instruction. It was a long-term instruction. It was one that looked seven generations, and I'm talking the full life of a person, not the generations they have today, 20 years or so. To us, that's not a generation. So he was saying, if you take care of the future, you'll be taking care of yourself. You yourself will have peace. So peace is what we want. Peace is what we're after. And the wars that are raging about now are violent, violent, uh, I would say examples of what happens when you, when you refuse to acknowledge a better way of life. And we have to do better if we're going to survive. And I'll tell you this, that the earth is not going to disappear. They have a great regenerative power, this earth. And one of my good friends, you know, John Mohawk, young man, what I call resident intellect of Iroquois, great, brilliant mind. He said, well, I always thought, he said, that human beings are still a biological experiment. We're here a short time. We haven't been here long. In the time of the Earth, not very long at all. And the Earth is not dependent on us. We're dependent on it. So that if we choose to er eradicate ourselves from this Earth, by whatever means, the Earth goes nowhere. And in time, it will regenerate. And all the lakes will be pristine. The rivers, the waters, the mountains, Everything will be green again. It'll be peaceful. There may not be people, but the earth will regenerate. And you know why? Because the earth has all the time in the world, and we don't. So I think that's where we're at right now. Sometime, sometime long ago, I think it was when Europe began to domesticate animals. I took a different course and direction in life from what things used to be. Not to say it was wrong, just simply what happened. And that developed into a whole idea of, of Europe. And it developed into nations, the idea of nations. They're relatively new, this idea of nations. Uh, nation states is certainly new. Um, and states, that's, that's almost within our lifetime, but not quite. Uh, this whole idea of, of consolidation of power in entities is, uh, has been a development of, of humanity to a great degree. Unless, of course, you were indigenous and you were living in the North Country, where you really had to depend on your, your knowledge of the environment to survive. The best teachers that we had and we learned from all the time was nature and the animals. They taught us a lot. And any, any indigenous person will tell you that. I know one of the leaders from Greenland, Inuit man, said, if it wasn't for the bear, we wouldn't know how to survive. And so it is that, that that's important, and, and um, what, what the teachers are, and, and what, how they do things, and how you observe that. Indigenous people have great observation. We've learned that over a period of time. I myself am, am not a, 
spiritual leader. I, I happen to agree to work for the Confederation and work for the Onondaga Nation, but I, I'm just simply a runner for elders and for people who, who knew a lot. And I'm not the best person, I don't think, in terms of representation of, of indigenous people. However, as it turned out, in this idea of running, and I do that a lot, I go everywhere and I speak, and they said, well, you've learned how to speak the English language very well, so you'll go and do it. And they instruct me what to say, and then I go and do it. But also in that process, you have to think on your feet and make some decisions and so forth. So anyway, over the period of time, uh, I, and, and I'm what you call a an acclimated man, and I think the Iroquois is. The Iroquois have been in contact with, with uh, Western and European society for a long time. Uh, the first treaty we had was 1613. It was called the Two Row Wampum. And we laid down some discussion points at that time. We said that, well, you know, you, you want to you wanna trade in our, our territory, We're talking to the Dutch, 1613. But we see that you're not seeming to go away here. So we think that maybe we better talk about relationship, how we're going to deal with one another. And so we set up the two-row belt, which essentially says that it's your ship, your people, your ways of life, uh, your government, our canoe, our people, our way of life. We go down through the, the river of life that just went up, side by side, and we'll be hooked together with a chain, three links, peace, friendship, for as long as the sun rises in the east, as long as the rivers run downhill, and as long as the grass grows green. That's where those words are. There it's the grandfather of all treaties between us and our white brother. And so you'll hear that. You'll hear those words again and again, whether you hear it from Oklahoma or whether you hear it. It's, it's a standard. And so we, we talked about respect there, and we respected them and we established a process. So I think at the time there was a real option on the part of, of uh, Europeans to change when they came here. But I, I, I think that two-row belt was, it was a great observation and a great comment on, on how we saw life. If you saw the belt, and we, we have it, it's uh, a white belt that's about three feet long and uh, has two rows of purple beads from the quahog shell. And the two rows are equal side by side going down the white representing peace and the river of life. And one row representing the boat and the other the canoe held together by this three links we call the covenant chain friendship. Now that was, you know, a time in the 16 or 13, 1613, you know, when Europe was in flame, so to speak, when there was uh, huge ravages of, of uh, typhoid and, and great plagues going on and a lot of starving uh, and wars. And I think it was what they brought over here. And I think at that time, if they listened more to our direction and took it a little bit more realistically, it might have been a, a, a great opportunity to change direction. But if you remember, in the northeast was the pilgrims that landed, and they were coming with a mindset about religion and God and law, which we thought was very curious because they did a lot of things we thought were just really dumb, really stupid. Uh, and and they didn't laugh or they didn't smile. They all wore black. But really, it was just uh, we were we were just kind of fascinated by this group of people, but and underestimated them, I'm sure. And and that idea, that mindset, and that Christian doctrine, that Christian idea, has really dominated this this land. And they said after a while, they said. If our if the blood runs to our ankles, we'll take our we'll take our land. And they called our land their land. 
if the blood runs to our ankles. So it, it, it showed that they were bringing this idea. And in the whole history of, of what occurred with the Spanish, the conquistadores, the uh, Inquisition, all going on, 1492, the Pope's declaration that we're flora and fauna, that we have no right of title to this land, established into U.S. federal law. Obviously, they had a chance. Second big chance was when they formed the United States, and we were working with them in that direction. Continental Congress came to us and said, will you fight with us against the King of England? And our chief said to him, that's your father. We know your father. Work with your father, we love your father. We know you, we work with you, and we love you as well. So we see this as a fight between father and son. So we think it wouldn't be proper to join in this family fight. The Continental Congress representatives, and they were meeting upstate New York then, uh, and they said, well, good. They said, because that was our second request. If you were not going to fight with us, you wouldn't fight against us. And we said, that's what we agree, we think. And Six Nations at that time was merely trying to survive these huge elements of, of power from, from France and from England and from Spain. And these, you know, whipsawing right across what is now New York. We were right in the middle of this thing. And using the best of our ability to survive and so we took that position, and uh, George Morgan, who was the one speaking, said, that's good, we agree with that. And so he went back to the Continental Congress, and John Hancock, the first president of the Continental Congress, commissioned a wampum belt to be made and to verify this, sanction this, and sanctify it, and this belt was made. He commissioned it, and they made it. This is, they were dealing in our style of government, Wampum. And the meeting was held at Fort Pitt, 1776, and that was the first peace meeting between the new United States and the Six Nation. And even at that time, Six Nation asked them, where's your flag? And they realized they really didn't have a flag. And, if, and the first flags that they flew, if you remember, was a pine tree. It was a pine tree with the eagle on top. And so they took a lot from us. They took a whole lot. Government by consent, by Carmel, two houses, elder brothers, younger brothers, council fires, the great fires they called themselves, the 13 fires, as we called ourselves, the six fires. Oh, we were really, really involved. Our chiefs were up and down the whole East Coast, almost every event, died on the road, trying hard to survive and keep the peace. And I think at that time, the opportunity was there. And then when they, when they made the, the Constitution, another great opportunity, but they wouldn't give up slavery. They would not give up slavery, and the women were nowhere to be seen. And we said, well, you know, how can you, how can you ignore 50% of the population, you know, not only that, but with so much, you know, dependent upon them. Well, that wasn't their style. And there was a kind of a reverting back to, to European thinking. And I think that was a failed point there in the history. And then they began to consolidate, and it worked up to the point when they called the, the Manifest Destiny about, about 1843, I think, first time that was mentioned. Manifest destiny. We we are. God has destined us to be the leaders, and, and um, I think it's that kind of thinking that uh, has been driving this country. And I think that these wars that we're engrossed in right now are nothing but an extension of that kind of thinking, and very very ill-timed and ill-conceived, and and you know has created such turmoil across the world. We have to have peace. We have to have a better understanding of who we are 
and there has to be a great sharing. So, so how can you expect a country? You know, who would elect President Bush? Although people will say that he didn't get elected, but you know, uh, you're talking about a, a you know the highest court in the world challenged for in, by their for their integrity. And now uh, Indian nations, you know, uh, trying to maintain themselves. Study made some time ago that found out that the Lakotas in Pine Ridge were the poorest people in the United States. And yet they should have one half of all home state coal mining. That should go to them, according to the Treaty of 1868, Fort Laramie. That was the agreement. And these treaties that we have today, that we still have, we try to uh, you know, activate them, it's impossible. Uh, it, it's ignored, but it's real. So I think America has to change course and quickly. They have to instruct the children in a better way. They have to be aware that there are forces larger than human forces. These forces are absolute with no mercy. And if you don't learn, you're just going to suffer the consequence. And so that's, uh, that's the instruction has to come from the leadership and from the people. There are so many good people in this world, and, and that gives me hope all the time. Now, you know, as I said before, uh, I, I represent a council, I represent a nation, I represent a confederation, and I represent often Indian thinking across America. We have a traditional circle of Indian elders and youth. We meet annually, and we have this discussion. And we talk about the condition of the earth and, and how it is and what's in store. And uh, there, is, there is hope, always hope. And the hope is in the conduct of the people. But the actions and time are forcing issues now. So I think that the the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you and that I reflect a lot of the learning that I've, I've learned, you know, from people like Gorbachev and, and Turner and, and uh, my, my good friend Dean Morton, uh, many, many good people in this world and many directed it the right way. And, and the fact that you yourself are, are taking this mission, which is what it is, uh, and that you have leadership, this young lad by the name of DiCaprio. I'm, I'm encouraged that, uh, to take the serious issue because that's what it's going to take, and you're going to have to bring awareness to the people. And I hope that this will help and help them understand that it's really almost not a question of who's right and who's wrong. It's a question of what do we do now. And that's the direction. What do we do now? And we organize our forces, and we organize our leadership, and we direct ourselves in a big unified effort around the world to act on behalf of the seventh generation and all the life on this earth. Peacemaker said to us in our instructions, he said, now I place in your hands the welfare of all life. He didn't say the welfare of the people. He said, the welfare of all life. Now, we take that literally. So when I travel and when I speak, I'm just doing my instructions that was given so long ago because our mandate is to look out for everybody. And I can tell you that when we have our ceremonies, and we're going to have a planting ceremony pretty soon, and we're going to have a ceremony for the strawberries, the leader of the fruit. And we'll have a ceremony for the beans. And we'll have a corn ceremony. When we have these ceremonies, you're all included. We don't, we don't say this is a ceremony for the underdoggers. We say this is a ceremony for the people. And we were told that as long as we hold these ceremonies, we're going to survive. As long as there's one to listen. Want to speak, want to sing, want to dance, we'll fight on. And so it's up to us. 
that comes down to us at the last minute. And we have to use our common sense, which is not so common anymore. And I think we have to rely on our, on our own observations and challenge poor leadership, change leadership, and act quickly and strongly and be convinced of our, our direction. And it certainly would reinforce the indigenous people, traditional people, uh, it would make us feel good to, to see this. And, and I can report you know, to, to my people, there's a group of people out there that are doing something. And uh, we'll see where it goes. And at least they're allies. So that's what we are, we're allies. And uh, it's a common fight, common cause. It's for the future. It's for peace. What could be better? It's a good fight. So we should be happy to be in it and happy to be able to make that difference. And I believe it's this generation, the next one coming, going to determine whether we survive.